Okay, and that's two o'clock. How's it going? My name is Jeff McCoy. I am work for Central Command. I am stationed in Silicon Valley right now, uh, perpetually TDY to Colorado Springs. Uh, so you are here. If you aren't sure, this is for Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes being built for space and for uh, air operations. So if you're in the wrong room, this would be a good time to. Yes, it's not Wi-Fi. Okay. Uh, before we get started, real quick, um, who in here has any idea what Kubernetes is at all? You've heard Kubernetes before. You've seen KAS. Okay. Who in here can explain Kubernetes to your coworker? Who can explain it to your grandmother? Okay. Cool. Good audience. I just want to make sure we have the right audience here, um, so I know who I'm talking to. So, uh, like I said, I am currently stationed in Silicon Valley. Uh, I am TDY right now to Colorado. And I was one of the original Kessel Run engineers, so one of the first two guys on Kessel Run. If you've heard of that, it's a agile software for air operations based out of Boston now. Um, after Kessel Run, I moved on to DIU, where I stood up uh, another organization called Rogue Squadron that does County UAS. And then from there, we've set up two more, what we're calling camps, that's Surf Camp and Space Camp. So what is Space Camp? Uh, space Camp is essentially, it's think Kessel Run for space. Essentially what it is, is we're trying to build agile software for the National Space Defense Center and the CSPOC, so Vandenberg and Colorado Springs. We're basically building apps and a continuous delivery model, much like Kessel Run did, but for space. Um, so I'm the CTO of Space Camp and Surf Camp, but I'm also the CTO of Level Up. You may not have heard of Level Up yet. Level Up is part of a unified platform, which doesn't have the best rap, um, but we are rebranding it, and we're trying to take the good things that Kessel Run did and the good things that Space Camp did, the continuous ATO, the continuous delivery model, and rebrand that and build it out for other organizations. There are actually 34 software factories right now across the DOD, so Kessel Run is one of 34. Uh, now, Kessel Run's a pretty large one, obviously, there's 650 people, but just so you know, there's actually a lot of this activity happening across the DOD right now. The DOD is trying to figure out how do we move faster, how do we deliver value to the warfighter faster, and, and one of the challenges I had in particular was how do we do that in a cost-effective model? So Kessel Run is a fantastic organization. You've probably been to some talks already about Kessel Run. Um, they also have one minor uh, caveat that is they have to use PCF right now. They're moving to other platforms, but PCF is very expensive. It's a fantastic platform. It does a lot for you. It really provides um, the Heroku-like experience, what's called the 12-factor app, the ability to just push code and it magically is built up, it's awesome. But the caveat is it takes a lot of overhead in the classified environment. Uh, it's not as easy as just push a button and you have software working for you when you're talking about classified air-gapped operations. So one of the things that Space Camp wanted to look at was how do, we, how do we do what PCF did for us, that amazing push button experience, but can we look at other technologies to do that? And specifically, how do we deal with microservices? Microservices, if you're not familiar, is just a concept of distilling down functionality into small chunks. And, and that, that's complicated to orchestrate those together. Uh, so if you look at the history of Kubernetes, Kubernetes came out of Google. It was a, a technology called Borg. Borg is used today for the, the, uh, what they call the planet cell computer. It deploys eight trillion, I'm sorry, eight billion containers a week. That's 660 containers a second. And they're doing this at, at little global scale, right? Now, if you look at the JWIX problem, the, the TS SAP, the SIPR SAP, the SIPR rail problem, we're not talking about billions of operations a second, but we're talking about needing high availability. I can't just have software that doesn't work if wars are counting on it. I can't have software that doesn't work if space control is counting on it. So when we look at Kubernetes, we don't look at it for the, we're going to serve 10 million customers a second. We don't have 10 million customers a second. What we're looking at is, can we guarantee transactions? Can we guarantee horizontal scale? Can I not have to worry about the infrastructure I'm deploying to. So when we chose Kubernetes, we looked at it because it seemed like the right solution. Though we're not solving the million ops a second problem, we are solving the high availability, the scalability problem. And, and so for that, we chose Kubernetes. But Kubernetes itself is, is complicated. Um, it's, it's not trivial. If you've tried to learn Kubernetes, if you try to spell Kubernetes, you will know that it is not something you can just flip a switch and learn tomorrow. It has taken us a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to, to comprehend what it means to deploy to Kubernetes. Uh, so we started Space Camp in, officially in January. Our first line of code was January 7th. We deployed first a Docker Swarm, which many of you probably heard of Docker Swarm before too. It's like baby's first Kubernetes thing before your Kubernetes. So we did that in March, um, realized that it wasn't scalable, it wasn't maintainable. Yes, it was simple, 
but it wasn't reliable either. So then we looked at Kubernetes, and it took us about two months to really figure out just the very first concepts of how do you deploy Kubernetes on the high side. Because if I go to JWix right now, I'd go type in a command to install tools to install Kubernetes, it'll work. But I try to spin up Kubernetes and it doesn't work. It doesn't work because Kubernetes packaging expects you to talk to gcr.io. So an interesting fact about all of Google Compute, you can have on-prem Google Compute that still has to tie back to the, the cloud computer, right? The, they call it their machine or their planet scale computer. So even if you're installing on JWix, you think it's working and then it just starts breaking because it can't finish the installation. Why? Because the packaging that Google's built and the IBM and Lyft and these other organizations that have built assumes you have internet connection at some point. So it doesn't work for us on JWix or Cipher or SAP or anywhere. So we stepped back and said, okay, what do we need to do to make this actually work? Um, now, I'm gonna attempt to do a demo on this guy right here. It's worked before, but I did blow up stuff earlier and I just got a keyboard in here a few minutes ago, so it should be interesting. But what we found was that there's a lot of little steps you have to do to make Kubernetes work on the high side. So we started toying with uh, building them out in a bunch of bash scripts, a bunch of shell scripts. It was about 25 scripts we created to make the process work reliably and stream it. But I didn't want to just deploy Kubernetes. Like that's actually not the hardest part of Kubernetes. The hardest part of Kubernetes is the day two management, which is how do I upgrade those applications? How do I change those applications? How do I maintain the state of those applications? How do I recover from disaster with those applications? So there's a lot of tooling out there in the Kubernetes ecosystem that allows us to do this but it doesn't work well on the high side. Um, so after a couple months of playing with a bunch of bash scripts, we decided we wanted to kind of codify this a little better so we could test it. And so we had to learn a new language, so we chose Golang. Why did we choose Go? Well, Go can deploy anywhere. So if you're familiar with what the Docker Scratch is, that's a, essentially an OS with no OS on Docker. Go runs there. And so our thinking was, let's build it with something that can go anywhere so that we can just give it a brand new computer and we can put all of our tooling on it, all of our application state, all of our systems in a declarative fashion. Now when I say declarative, uh, this is important because um, I was in San Francisco about two years ago for Kessel Run, and we had a situation come up with one of the first apps, Jigsaw. Um, we couldn't understand the state of the application. Now, we're in San Francisco, there's no access to Zipper, the app's on Zipper, our, our operators are getting mad, and we, we had to do something. So literally, I had to take a flight same day to Qatar to go address an issue because I could talk to the operators, and I was talking to the sysadmin guys, they couldn't tell me the state of the app. They couldn't tell me what version they had deployed. They couldn't tell me what was being used. So I had no idea as an engineer what was actually, the, what was actually on the high side. So our fix was to get three plane tickets and go hop to the Middle East for a day to go fix it. That's a terrible solution, just in case you were curious. Also very exhausting. So we thought about that, that's, been, that's stuck with me, right? So PCF's amazing, it's a great technology. Class and environments are a challenge. How do we do declarative? And that's, that's the real key. And there's a, there's a concept here that's very important. Imperative is a state of, I have a GUI, I'm an operator, I'm gonna go change something, right? That creates a new state. For, we're talking system administrator, not your data, not your application, but the system administrator. I'm gonna change a configuration. That changes state of the application. What happens when it dies? The sysadmin answer is, well, you restore it and you, know, you back up, restore it. Uh, the declarative answer, the, the Kubernetes answer is, you don't need to do that. You've already declared it, and if it dies, just recreate it from the previously declared state. Why does this matter? So if you look at um, any infrastructure as code solution, which is codifying how you declare your infrastructure into code, you can then version control that. So now I can say, three months ago, we had this orchestration, this configuration, I can now roll that back to that point in time and know exactly where I'm at. So we took this concept of infrastructure as code and we kind of rolled it into what we're calling platform as code. And essentially it's the same concept except that we're committing to into Git all of our manifest declarations. Now here's why this is really cool. So if I'm a developer and I want to see the state of my applications, we have one that's called Astro. It's a MIT Lincoln Labs uh, refactor. It's a rewrite of one of their um, PhD apps that's turned into an actual used system on the ops for at NSDC. We're making it professional now. Well, it's, it's a bunch of microservices right now. They have to work together. They have to talk to Kafka, which is an event stream system. It's kind of messy to deal with. It's complicated. Um, on top of that, we wanted to add security, so we added Istio. If I tell a developer, go start up your microservices to go test this, they're going to they're say, how? 
right? Their, their job is to write code, not to orchestrate microservices. They don't care about that stuff. They just want to write code. So I don't want to have to hire somebody that both is an expert in code and infrastructure. That's, that's too tedious and too expensive. So what we did was we took those manifests that were deploying in production, the declarative state of infrastructure, and we pushed it all the way back, call it shift left, all the way back to the developer box. So what this means is when I'm a developer and I sit down on my terminal, I can spin up the environment literally, literally identical to the production environment. All the controls, all the restrictions, all the ingress controls, all the authentication pieces, every piece of state that's derived from those manifests, I can also do now for the developer. And you may be thinking, well, okay, what do you do? That's not a big deal. This is actually enormous. What this means now, and this actually happened last week, if I have something that's dependent on something else, we call it chain dependencies, and it breaks something, usually you don't see that to your like last leg integration test or last mile pre-deployed -de pre production. So you put it up on JWix, you're doing your test, and then it breaks. We now see that as the developer is writing code. We just took out hours worth of testing and automation and shifted all the way back to the developer's box. So the minute that he made that line change that created that dependency that caused the cascade failure, he sees it in his box. So one of the things about Agile is you're talking about reducing feedback loops, right? So you go to the user, you get feedback, you reduce the feedback loop. That's how we deliver value faster. What, what we're saying with Kubernetes is we're doing the same thing for the developer with their software they're building. So their feedback loop is being reduced, it's being tightened, so that they're seeing faster the things they are doing are either good or bad. Now, yes, we have tests. Yes, we have automation tests, integration tests, unit tests, but they don't cover everything, right? Don't believe the Kool-Aid. You can write really, really bad tests that actually do nothing. I've seen tests in Kessel Run, I've written tests in Kessel Run that were a dumpster fire. They just didn't work. Like, they passed, but they didn't actually test the behavior we're looking to test. Now, the Air Force is starting to figure this out, and we're starting to look at Afotech and the test organization just saying, hey, help us write tests better. So we're trying to work through that now, but for a long time, developers could write bad tests and it would just fly under the radar until it's time to fix something else. And then you're cussing the person behind you who made all those bad tests because you have to go back and fix them. I've literally seen two lines of code affect 40 tests. That's a terrible, terrible idea. It's called tightly coupled testing. So we have those tests, but what this does for th th this manifest does for us, it allows us to declare and predict state in a way that we can reproduce over and over. So, on this nook right here, um, now this is actually kind of just a GWiz demo thing at first, um, but it's actually very relevant right now because part of Level Up's organization is they're onboarding, and you may have seen this on LinkedIn, they're onboarding the F-16. So, I had the F-16 PMO out at Space Camp last week, and they're out again this week actually, testing out some of their physical modules that are on the jet to see how we can put Kubernetes on them. It's actually kind of hard, uh, because those modules are very, very, very old. They're very underpowered. PowerPC, ARM, AMD64, it's a mix of architectures, and, and there's not like one easy solution. And so I talked to, to Nicholas Shalon, the Air Force CSO, uh, about this problem, because he's the one who sent them to us. And I said, hey, Mr. Shalon, here's, here's the problem set, here's what we got, and his answer was just make him buy a new hardware. And I'm like, I wish, right? Like it's, it, it actually costs a lot of money to put that on a thousand jets. So, so we're working through these problems, like the right answer is buy new hardware, right? Because what they're trying to do is almost impossible. But this actually is about as powerful as what we're gonna get on the jet, times two. So F-16 is pretty old. It's, um, the stuff is, I'm kind of shocked at the age actually. But um, learning to work in this constrained environment allows us to do what's called computed edge, right? So one of the things, um, and I'll talk to this in a second, it's just gee whiz stuff. One of the things that Computed Edge does for us, it allows us to push some of the compute to the last mile. So who's used Cipronet before in here? Anyone use Cipronet? Who's loved the experience? Yeah, right? Right, we, we know latency's terrible. We know it's unreliable. JWix is the same thing. SAP is sometimes worse. So, so we understand that there, things aren't great there, right? So Computer Edge gives us the ability to push from that compute to the last mile. Um, Kubernetes allows us to do this very trivially. This is not some rocket science for Kubernetes. Deploying to an edge compute device, say this guy right here, is actually not the hardest thing in the world. Uh, deploying to large scale clusters is also just as easy. Um, now, it, we've actually found that building clusters is a simple part. Um, creating clusters is not what makes this whole problem interesting. 
What makes this problem interesting is how you manage that after the fact. All right. So right now, as soon as I mute my phone, um, what we did here, we issued one command, and I'm really sorry this is hard to read. Um, let's see if I can get this up for a little bit more. So Minion is just a, a Go CLI we built. Fun fact, it was actually not supposed to be that Minion. It was supposed to be the fish Minion from Megamind, but we had a very dedicated officer create a 3D printed version of that, so we had to rebrand it. So it actually was a fish before. But essentially what this is, it's a Go CLI, so you go through here and you can look at what the different options are and what it is. It's not super interesting. I won't bore you with all the details there. But what it's doing, or what it just did, was it used kubeadmin under the hood to generate a cluster. Um, now, like I said before, that's, that's not that interesting. Like, it's just a command and it creates it. What's interesting there is how we're doing that. Um, so one of the things we do is we go through all the declared manifests. It's called YAML, which is a plain text format. We absorb all of the images from it. We we find them all, we, we relabel them, and push them back into what we're calling a transient registry. And what this means is we can lift and shift our entire cluster state from place to place, and we can do it incrementally. And that's valuable because now we're declarative from in class to class, or from Zipper to JWix, or whatever the environment is, um, and we're able to do it predictably. So over time, we're not just taking whole sets of images up and deploying them, we're taking pieces of images up. So the example I give is if you have 10 apps in production, and say, of those 10, only two changed, right? So the normal model would be you would take those two apps up and you would redeploy them. Well, this could be big apps. And so one of the problems is data guards right now, that's low to high uh, guards, are pretty limited in what they can do. So you're talking burning disks and all that, that mess. What we've done is we're not actually taking the entire app up. We're taking the slice that changed, right? So Docker splits things up into layers or chunks. We'll actually take that last mile of changes and bring it up. And, and here's the alternative. I was talking to a, a large defense industrial based contractor a few weeks ago about how they're doing this for a space program. I won't name names. They're taking 10 apps from secret to SAP. And the way they do it is they purchase a hard drive and they load 30 gigs of data onto it and they take it to SAP and they reload that on there and then they destroy the hard drive. So for every deployment, this is how they're doing Kubernetes, right? So the alternative is you take physical disks, you make them burner disks, if that's a thing, and you bring them up the entire thing. We're not even taking images. We're only taking the things that changed. How do we know it's still safe? We're using git to do it. So we're using a thing called git bundle, which allows you to take increments across an air gap. If you Google it, it actually says sneaker net and the word and why they did it. Uh, I think they did it for research laboratories. I couldn't imagine they actually do it for government, but it works really well, well for us, as it turns out. So we use git bundle. So what we did here while I was talking, which was just a command, I, I mean, you can, if you're really curious, it's essentially just, it's hard to read, but that little line there, it says create the cluster, allow it to be scheduled for master, use this Wi-Fi IP. I actually can't pull it up on here because they blocked that. They don't allow them to talk, which is kind of sad. But you can see, actually first I'll give you this. All right, so that's quite, kind of hard to read, but you can start to see some stuff spinning up there. Um, all that is is just some of the base Kubernetes things, the images that it needs to deploy, and it's deploying them from that local registry. So it actually is synchronized that local registry, and it's deploying it from that, um, which here isn't as cool because, well, I mean, we have Wi-Fi, but when you're deployed and you're deploying it to JWix or Zipper, I don't know if you can read it, but it says master 45,000, really small text, so sorry, I can't zoom up raw Linux box, but that right there is actually, and it says master45000 slash kns.gcr.io. So what we did was, it was pointed to gcr.io, which is Google's container registry. We just prepended our local little temporary registry to it and pushed it in there. So now we can do the same process over and over. This is how we're doing JWix right now. So when we deploy to JWix on C2S, we're doing the same process. We declare our state, we test our state, we then shift it up to the high site and produce it up there. Before I go on, have I completely lost all of you? 80% lost you? Okay. Awesome. One person's tracking. We have 1% success. Great. Cool. Um, so I'm sorry, it's a super nerdy stuff. Um, I'm trying to, to balance the, the business value here, but also like it is, it's a very complex problem. So um, we went pretty far, we thought, 
um, but I really felt like we needed some more help. Um, so Space Camp, we decided to do some contracting work. So we actually hired Rancher Labs, Weaveworks, and a local company in, in Colorado uh, called Student Innovation, which has TSSCI cleared folks to help us. So they just started this past two weeks. So no, they're not going behind us to kind of clean up what we've done and make sure it, it makes sense. Because the idea here is, um, if you imagine like the air gap deployment process, think about an F-16, right? I can't just stream a change to it right now. Even if it's networked, I probably wouldn't want to. There's a, there's a control process, there's, there's a change management process there. I need a way to segregate that change and restrict that and to control that over time. So this same process is what we're doing with F-16 right now. We're attempting to take these, this software they're building today, which is brand new, new capability, and test it out on these components on the jet over time. So incrementing it in piece by piece. The process doesn't, ma it doesn't matter if it's an F-16 random you know, LRU or if it's C2S, which is essentially GovCloud on JWIX. The, the process of deploying the, the solution space is the same. Um, so that's where we're at today is, is attempting to, to build that out. So I'll try to give you a couple more uh, things. I'm going to switch computers now because this is going to get boring to do it on here. So if you'll bear with me for one second, I'm going to move HDMI cables. Hopefully it doesn't blow up. Bonus, you'll be actually able to see this screen. Okay, make this readable real quick. If you guys can see this, well, come on, projector. I believe in you. Okay, hopefully this is reasonably big enough for you guys. So I'm going to do the same thing. The way we do our our testing in order to to prove this concept out, we have to build this over and over and over. So we end up building these clusters dozens, sometimes several dozen times a day. Uh, and our pipelines, our continuous delivery pipelines, are also constantly redeploying and building these out. So we're constantly iterating on this concept and, and adding new capability to it. So um, essentially, what it boils down to, we have a few basic commands we use here in our environments. The one we care about right now is camp start because we're unoriginal. And so as it's building out, I'll talk through some of the stuff that's happening here. So we're using a technology called Vagrant, which is just a, a way to automate vir virtualization. It's just virtual box under the hood. We just need a way to be predictable about it. So what it's doing is boring Vagrant stuff. After it does that, um, once it pulls it down, it'll start using Minion to actually create the cluster and build the capability and deploy the stuff to it. Um, now this is starting from a bare bones box. The only thing we did was we enabled virtual box additions because it takes like 10 minutes to install it by itself and we got really impatient. So it started with bare bones Linux. It's now creating all the dependencies it needs, installing them. So you see git there, for example. We need git so we can do the git bundle process. So it's going to do that and add those capabilities. Once it has its base OS built, it'll then start doing um, what's called minion prepare. Now this is, this is going to take a little bit, and it's kind of weird what it does. But essentially, this is that re-tagging thing. Um, so if you think about the way Docker works, Docker essentially has labels it points to those labels match to a, a server slash some folder path, essentially. It's basically what it roughs, roughs out to. What we did was we took those, the server slash folder path and we just made that server part also a folder path, what's what we call retagging, and made master 45,000 the hard-coded uh, version of that tag. So that's what's happening here. We're taking this in from Google. Whoop, don't die. Taking this in from Google and then we're retagging it onto master 45,000 and, and making sure everything's set. So this is going to take a minute, so I'm going to pause for questions right now. You have to ask questions, you're leaving me hanging, it's awkward. Yes, sir? I've got a question. You just kind of help me understand both the scale of what you're doing. But so out there at Space Camp, um, you're, you're working on scope and scale for SMC type missions. And so uh, where do you see, where are you now, where do you see it going in the next couple of years as you continue to build up? 
you know, do you have a customer? Yep. Do you have a mission? Or what missions are you looking to achieve? That's a great question. So Space Camp's really weird. Um, we're somewhat self-formed. So uh, one of my, my bosses here in the front row from Central Command, he was nice enough to let me go hang out in Colorado for a few months initially. That was the initial ask. And it was a partnership between Central Command and the Air Force Research Laboratory and a couple SMC folks, not very many really. We were kind of doing our own thing, just trying to deliver it to the NSDC. What happened was uh, Kobayashi Maru is the name of the organization that SMC has under uh, Colonel K. She, she essentially said, I'm going to divert some resources to support this more, and we became partners. Um, so, so what happened over time was we started serving the broader SMC community, which is the CSPOC and NSDC. We were focused on one customer up front. At the same time, um, there in Colorado Springs, there was a space accelerator, so there was constantly folks running through for different programs, and so we started partnering with uh, Northcom. So NORAD is, is now has something they're deploying to the capital region to do drone protection. We built that, and they're deploying that under Northcom. We have uh, some Southern Command stuff. We have some Cyber Command stuff. We have a lot of different partnerships. And then a few months later, Level Up came on, came to partner with us as well under Nick Chalon, the CSO. So. Today, where we're at is we're just trying to refine this process of delivering for our customer, but we're also trying to codify it in such a way that we can do what Nick Shalon says is push button factors of service. So that's like the, probably the one to two year vision, um, though he might tell you the three month vision. <laughs> He's more aggressive than I am. Um, but essentially it's, you come in, you're a wing commander, and you, wanna, you want your smart people to build software, and you want it to be legal and accredited and done right. Um, there's not, a, there's not a process for doing that right now. The process is you know someone who's done that before and you call them and they start making trades and agreements, negotiations, they've been MOA and, and you can start to partner. It's a very ad hoc process. So I get a lot of, it's all the same folks. We're all doing the same thing. If you look at all the different factories out there, we've all either worked at them or touched them or are leading them or have been a part of them at some point in the past. It's the same people over and over. So we're trying to codify a process that allows us to not just have this, what amounts to a bro network, but have an actual way to do this that's legitimate. Because right now, it literally is just that. It's all just who you know, networking, right? Um, we want to make it to where anyone can do it. And we're talking really like the, the group commander level, the wing commander level has resources they want to put towards a problem. There is a separate effort um, that's being talked about, Drudana, um, which out of Bespin, which is the any air could code concept. That's, we're not looking to solve that problem right now. Uh, Lauren Nosselberger has people doing that separately. This is all about, Level Up is about a, a group of people want to build software as a factory, but they don't have the expertise to build the accreditation and the pipeline, do all the rules and do it right. We're trying to enable that piece. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so that's actually a, a really good question. So um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Istio, but essentially um, the, the Istio is a, is a tool that we use as a part of the, the DevSecOps model that the CSO is, has established, which essentially um, with Kubernetes, when you pair Istio and, and Kubernetes together, um, you really get kind of a platform. Uh, so what it does is it, it hijacks the traffic of every pod you deploy. So you have an app, a Hello World app, and it it literally just says, hello world, right? Pretty simple. What Istio does is it puts a pod or a container right next to your container and it takes all your traffic and intercepts all your traffic at the kernel level and then it applies policies to that and it secures it. Um, so in fact, what it's doing right now, um, well, it's still building the cluster right now, but what it's gonna do in a minute, you'll see it say waiting for Istio. Um, what it's doing is once Istio is created, it creates what's called a service mesh. So every single lane of traffic that flows across the service mesh is monitored and encrypted. Um, so there's not just, and it's not just encryption to be encrypted, it actually is mutual TLS authentication, which essentially means that if you've ever used your CAC, right, to authenticate, um, your CAC is a strong, hard token, fair? Uh, it's a PKI-backed token. What Istio does is it issues tokens or certificates to every pod and says, here's your issue, here's your issue, here's your ID, and then based on policy, it allows them to talk or not to talk. What this means is if I'm an app developer, I don't have to worry about encryption. In fact, we tell our developers not to encrypt anything. We just don't do encryption at all. We enforce it at the cluster level. So, I mean, they can do it if they want to, but it's just gonna be overhead 
you know, compute overhead as it has to do that encryption in the application. So this allows us to not worry about encryption, authentication. So authentication we used to do on JWIX, we were doing MTLS auth on JWIX, which meant that when you went to one of the apps, you'd have to put in your JWIX certificate, your token, and that would give you access. Now Istio does that for us. It can enforce that, and your app never sees any traffic until it's already passed the gateway and been certified and, and met, met the policies. I think Istio is one of the most game-changing, invasive things on a, an orchestration layer. Um, and I don't use that lightly. It really is, from an app developer perspective, it is truly game-changing. Now, from a sysadmin perspective, from ops, day two ops, it can be kind of a pain because you're dealing with a lot more policy. You have to think a lot more about traffic. You're, you're just, you're much more, you're much deeper into the network than you usually are. So typically, you have other systems that will do this for you. Istio does this um, itself, um, which has its pros and cons, but, but to answer your question for security, um, let's see if it's actually started yet. It's already gone through. Um, you'll see some stuff about Istio being created there. Uh, Istio is what we use to secure the entire mesh. Every piece of traffic going in and out is either filtered or restricted based on policy. Um, and the last thing I'll say to that is what Docker did for the file system, in other words, I can guarantee an absolute path and it'll, it's portable everywhere because it's a container, it's like magic, Istio does for the network layer. So I tell our, my app developers, don't put an environment variable for the database. Don't put an environment variable for your Kafka stream. Just say Kafka and the cluster will handle the rest. And what this allows us to do is have app developers not focus on annoying configuration things. They can build value and build products. And then we'll handle at the cluster layer, at the policy layer, how that talks to what. Because today that might be a Kafka internal to that Kubernetes cluster. Tomorrow it might be a, a DAS somewhere. We just don't know. This allows us to be able to change on the fly without telling the app developer to go recode something. Other questions? This is so quiet, it makes me nervous. Okay, we'll keep going. We need another chance for questions. Okay, so what's happened here as we were talking? I'll scroll up a little bit. Essentially, um, there's a bunch of stuff that happened here, including my broken minion screen. All right, so we saw it install a bunch of RPMs. We're working on this part. Um, we want this to not be a dependency management system. Um, so one of the things we're working on, which is kind of interesting, is we're looking at statically compiling uh, code or open source libraries. So I'm sure you all have tracked the news. OpenSSL has had issues in the past. SSH has had issues in the past. CentOS and RHEL do a good job of backporting those security concerns, but we think we can do it faster. Um, and if we're compiling from source, like nightly snapshots, and the minute the CVE comes out, we can track that and rebuild that on the fly. Um, we're playing with that right now, but we also have a partnership with Red Hat to do upstream binaries and update them on the fly as well. So we're kind of comparing options here and seeing what works, but I would personally love to get out of the, the game of managing dependencies here and just do static binaries and just inject them. Um, if you don't know what that means or why that's valuable, with dependency management, it's a running joke in Linux. It's called dependency management hell. Um, essentially, you have this dependency which needs these 10 things, which need these 10 things, and then you have a whole tree of things. And Git's actually one of the worst offenders we have. Most of that stuff there is for Git. It's just for Git. Git has like 30 dependencies for CentOS. So we can statically compile it and then it's one binary, which is much more portable, as it turns out. So we're playing with that right now, if that makes sense for us. We're also looking at K3S, RKE, um, OpenShift tasks and stuff they do in that space as well um, with the libOS tree. So there's a lot of options we're playing with, but our hope is to get to the point where your clustering technology isn't told to you by level up. You pick what you've purchased, because a lot of people have purchased Red Hat, a lot of people have purchased Pivotal, they've already paid for these things, they're gonna use them. You use what you need to do, we'll just solve the very unique niche government problem of how do we incrementally deploy to air-gapped environments. That's really what we're trying to solve. The rest of it, how you deploy your cluster, how you create it, isn't as big of a concern to us. We think there's a lot of good tools to do that already. So it did the dependencies, installed them, a bunch of stuff for Git, all those Perl things are Git. And then it creates the Docker registries. Um, and again, this is, this is kind of strange, but it, it literally creates two Docker registries pointing to the same source, which is inversion controlled. Um, and this allows us to do the incremental snapshotting. We're, we're playing with other options besides Git. Git's not the best um, at speed uh, because it has to do a binary check 
which means it's actually hashing those values, which is great to guarantee it really is what you said it is. Not great because it's kind of slow. Um, so we're working on that right now, experiment with other options. But for now, it's Git because it works well. Creating all these images, retagging them, a bunch of stuff. So you go back up here. OK, after I did all this tagging stuff, um, then it's going to go through and process these manifests. Let's see if I can show you something interesting here besides green text. OK, so what should be done now, I'm going to just jump in here real quick. And now I'm going to go from this machine into uh, the virtual machine, which is running this cluster and all the configuration. So we want to check it out now. And I'm actually awful at typing. It's just absurd. So I'm going to alias this. OK. So I don't think you can see all this craziness here, but I, the few minutes ago before we started this talk, this was an empty CentOS box, nothing run on it, no configuration. It was just Linux, and that's it. Um, we could have gone back further, but it would have taken longer, and well, we have deadlines. So during that time when we were talking, it deployed Istio. That's all those Istio system things. It deployed Kubernetes. It deployed Metal LB, which is a load balancer we use um, here because we're on an offline environment. Um, on C2S, we use ELB, which is Amazon's load balancer because it's available. Um, and then you see some Space Camp Kafka, Space Camp Gravitas, Space Camp Sentry. Those are apps running. But the important part to the security question earlier is how do we do security? And this right here is, is how we do it. That 2 of 2 is very important in Kubernetes land. That means that for that one declared pod, there is actually two different images. Think of it like two different Docker images running side by side. They're sharing a file system, and they're sharing network I.O. And the sidecar, which is Istio, is hijacking all the traffic from that other pod, intercepting it, and enforcing policies on it and encrypting it for us. So if I look here, all right, so you see here 172.16.10.10 is our load balancer. So if I curl this, I'll start to see traffic on there. Unfortunately, all these apps require classified data to be interesting. So I can't really show you much because they're just dumb interfaces. Um, I was really hoping, hoping to get our, our VR one done and pushed up in time, but I didn't get my keyboard in time, unfortunately. Um, we have one called Space Cockpit. It's done by a company called Saber Astro, which is based in, in Boulder and Australia. They're split, which is interesting. Um, they're building a, it's a VR and a 3D WebGL interface for space situational awareness. It's very interesting. You can actually see all of the or satellites orbiting live in a 3D space, either on the VR or, or just um, on the WebGL 3 desktop, kind of think computer game. It's written actually with Unity 3D, which is a gaming engine. And it's written by game developers. So when I talk to them, they, I'm not a gamer, so I don't really understand like, the culture or lingo. And they'll talk to me about the, the multiplayer setup. And like, they'll talk in terms of how a gamer would talk about players and you know, like, winning things. I'm like, I don't, I don't get it at all, guys. But, but it seems cool. It looks really impressive. Unfortunately, I couldn't deploy it in time because well, mistakes are made. All right, so, so all that's interesting here is this is just Kubernetes stuff. It's, it's nothing super fancy. It's, it's just Kubernetes with Istio. Um, what's, what's interesting to me, though, is that we took from nothing, we deployed everything that we're calling to deploy on JWix. This is the same declarative version as JWix. And now it's just running. And if I, if I wanted to change something, if I thought that there was something I wanted to tweak, or I could go and apply those. But let's say I completely changed the application. I could also just redeclare it. And so by doing camp start again, what's going to happen? It's going to destroy everything. Right, the entire cluster is gone. The, the, the machine is gone. It's going to literally destroy it. It's going to recreate it from scratch. It's going to rebuild it again and do the whole thing all over again. And if I'm doing this a bunch during the day, I might turn off the prepare step because I know I just prepared it myself, so I can speed it up. But the point being, it'll just start over from scratch, and we'll do this dozens of times a day. Most of it's automated. We don't usually do it manually, but the point being, we're able to iterate over and over and find the right vein of solution for JWix, for Sipper, for SAP, for the F16, but also we're able to codify that, to code that in, and to predictably reproduce that over and over and over. Because it's not just something some guy clicked on a screen and put wrote a checklist for. It's not some spreadsheet that says, here's how you solve that. It's declared, it's committed, it's tracked in code. So there's no variance or deviation there. Additional questions? Space Camp or Kubernetes or Istio or anything? 
Yes, sir. So you mentioned you were using Istio to, to manage security across the, the entire deployed environment. Does that mean that there's no security configuration on any of the pods that are in there? Like I noticed the Kafka when it was in there, so you're not doing TLS or any actives or anything in the Kafka environment? R that's right, yeah. So, and we've gone back and forth on what the right answer is there. Um, so I think that where we're at today, um, we're leaning towards no configuration at all for things like Kafka. There's, there actually is using a password. It's Space Camp. You all have the password now. But we don't use it, right? It's, it doesn't matter because what's actually authenticating is their TLS tokens on both sides. Istio issues them through Citadel, and then that's how they actually negotiate. That extra password is just like a speed bump you have to do because Kafka doesn't know how to handle unauthenticated properly, so we have to have some of the authentication. But our goal right now is to try that with Istio, but that's not certain. There's still some, there's some thorns there with security we have to work through. Uh, explaining to them that, by the way, an X-19 cert is far more secure than a 20-character password. That's, it's, it's just not quite got to all the security folks yet. Um, our environments, um, we have a platform and a infrastructure ATO right now, official ATO. Um, and we probably, I think we're at continuous ATO now. We had our pen test a couple weeks ago, and the results, because they were hitting Istio, they found nothing. Both teams found nothing. In fact, they told us, Dark Web Solutions told us that we were better than they'd seen us in the commercial space and security. Not because we're actually good, but because Istio and Kubernetes does that for us, and we locked everything down. Um, we also do hardened containers, though. Um, so working with the DSOC, which is the, um, the Air Force's vision to do hardened containers, we're building out really, really restricted containers. Uh, we whitelist binaries, which means that you don't get all this, the free tools inside a pod to do bad things. We take them away from you. You can't even write to the file system. Um, so th we gave them access to the cluster even, and they still couldn't break in and get across because with MTLS enforcing, even if I'm inside your pod, even if I'm a bad guy and I have physical root access to your pod, I still can't do anything because it's a zero trust network. So regardless of how hard you try, and, and I did because I'm also our insider threat at Space Camp. We tried, we couldn't break out of the pods. Um, I could break out of a, a regular Alpine, which is the secure Docker image pod on JWIX in about 10 seconds. I couldn't touch our pods, neither could our pen testers. So we think it's a pretty good solution, but as far as like final answer on that, I don't know yet. Other questions? else? You guys super bored? I don't know. I don't do these conferences very often. I don't know how this... I'm sorry. It's a super nerdy. I know this might be not everyone's thing. Um, all right. So just to wrap it up, Space Camp is delivering right now for space. Think Kessel Run Space. Level Up's job is to be the, the factory as a service incubator, if you will, for all of the factories down the road um, and, and try to codify all these practices using Kubernetes and Istio. Um, there are options to not use Istio as well because Istio is hard, uh, but the requirement is essentially do what Istio does, which as it turns out is actually harder. Um, when it comes to where we're going to head in the next two to three years, we still don't know. We don't have all the answers here. And, and we, we always tell everyone at Space Camp, we don't claim to have all the answers, but we try to find smart partners to help us build that future version of, of what this should be. So we tell every person we hire and bring in, please tell us where we're stupid. Tell us what we're doing wrong. We want to know the things you see today, the red flags, so we can make it right. Um, because the last thing you want at Space Camp or Level Up or these organizations is to assume that we have all, all figured out, because we just don't. This is a moving target. Other questions? Thank you for your time.